Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today we'll be watching part two of Thomas Cochran, Craziest Sea Captain in History by Kings and Generals. So this is the second part of our short three-part series on the Scottish Sea Wolf of the Napoleonic Wars, Thomas Cochran. Last time we saw sort of the early to mid-Napoleonic Wars, we saw that Cochran was a brilliant but stubborn guy. And so the stubbornness restricted his career a little bit, but he was so talented that he rose through the ranks regardless. So, we're basically picking up from the midpoint of the Napoleonic Wars. If you guys end up enjoying this video, I'd very much appreciate it if you would check out the Patreon, which is linked in the description, or channel memberships, which you can check out by hitting the join button next to the subscribe button. If you check those out, you will get exclusive reaction content. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, let's jump right into this reaction. In August of 1806, he was appointed to the HMS Imperieuse, a sturdy 38 cannon frigate that was significantly more powerful than Pallas. Okay, 1806, Cochrane keeps moving up. He's getting bigger and better ships to command. As the high command of the British Navy can't help but recognize his talent, even though, like I mentioned, he is a very stubborn guy. Imperius soon became an icon of glory for the British Navy, and a consistent scourge to France. It would be in 1808 when Cochrane hit his stride once more off the coasts of Spain. This was a year when the British army was embroiled in a desperate land struggle across mm. the Iberian Peninsula against their Napoleonic foe and Cochrane's naval contributions to the war effort were invaluable. Yeah, and Napoleon, uh, as we saw in our series on the Napoleonic Wars, he would be stuck in Spain for years and years and years fighting both the British and Portuguese armies, but more so all of the Spanish rebels and guerrillas that were constantly harassing the French occupiers in Spain. But... The Brits and the Portuguese definitely played a big part in that. The writings of contemporary novelist Sir Walter Scott emphasize as much, claiming the captain had, with his single ship, kept the whole coast of Languedoc in alarm, hmm. destroyed telegraphs of utmost importance to the French, preventing troops being sent from that province into Spain, and excited such dismay that 2,000 men were drawn from Figueres to oppose him men who otherwise would have been marching further into the peninsula. Wow. I mean, look, when we watched the Napoleonic Wars series, we primarily focused on the land battles, right? Because that's where Napoleon operated. That's where you can really see Napoleon's brilliance. But as I've mentioned several times, you have to remember that one of the main reasons why Napoleon was defeated in the end was because Britain was able to keep up its naval supremacy. So it was able to prevent Napoleon from invading uh, and really sort of ruin Napoleon's continental system through blockades and smuggling. So that British naval dominance, um, which, of course, Thomas Cochran is helping at this moment, is extremely crucial to the entire war effort. Despite his success, Cochran continued to lament upon the lack of recognition he received from the British Admiralty often claiming in his autobiography that they not only failed to give him any praise, but in fact cheated him and his crew out of their rightfully earned prize money. Mm. In June, the Imperius... Yeah, I mean, we've already seen there's some beef between sort of the High Command and Cochrane. I think part of that is due to Cochrane being so abrasive, but at the same time, that shouldn't necessarily matter because he is so talented and successful. The issue is, is that these, you know, elite commanders and officers, they can't look past sort of the broken social mores, right? They want him to conform and show a little more respect to them, and then they would be willing to reward him adequately. Cochrane doesn't want to do that. He wants to do things his own way. And so, you know, we're sort of at a bit of an impasse. Though, as we're seeing, Cochrane does continue to move up through the ranks sailed for Mongat, a Catalonian fortress under the occupation of French troops under General Duchesne. With the help of Catalan guerrillas, he launched a two-pronged assault on the coastal battery, capturing it soundly. He would later go on to seize and decipher French codebooks, 
and occupy Fort Trinidad, wow. causing invaluable losses in French manpower, intelligence, resources, and time. Nice. To many among friend and foe, the sea wolf had become larger than life, more vengeful spirit than man. <laughs> it was this reputation that would see him conscripted into the largest fleet engagement of his life, a contest that would serve as the climax to his naval boldness and the peak of his hubris. The Okay, I'm excited. And I think that is a good word for it, hubris. Now, I think Cochrane is rightfully confident. I mean, he has the ability, um, so it's fair enough to be confident, but there is definitely ego and hubris there. I mean, we can absolutely see that in his personality. Battle of Basque Roads. Okay. In spring of 1809, a Royal Navy fleet was being hastily assembled by one Admiral Gambia in order to confront a French flotilla that had escaped a British blockade in Brest and now lay anchored in the well-protected mouth of the River Charente, mm. a region known as Basque Roads. The French intention was to escape into the open Atlantic and harry British interests in the West Indies, which the British under no circumstances could allow. To this yep, Britain had to defend its empire, and it's worth remembering, you know, when we talk about the Napoleonic Wars, we usually think about it in a European context, which is fair, because that is primarily where the conflict took place, but, you know, there's also conflict going on throughout the entire world due to the fact that France and Britain were both empires. At this point, Britain more than France, and France had lost a lot of its territory following the Seven Years' War. But particularly, if we look at the Caribbean or North America, we see a lot of conflict involving the French Empire, the British Empire, and the young United States. So there are other theaters of this war, just on a smaller scale compared to the massive conflict that was occurring in Europe. At this end, the Admiralty directly sought out its most dauntless post-captain. Cochrane's reputation as a maverick made using him a risky gamble, hmm. but his daring nature and unquestionable naval genius were exactly what the Royal Navy needed to complete the total destruction of the French Atlantic fleet. Yeah, I mean, look, he might not be the guy who you invite to the, uh, the officer parties or whatever, because you might make a show and uh, embarrass you, but if you need a guy to get the job done, uh, a dangerous, daring job, Cochrane is the guy you go for. At the Palace of Whitehall, Cochrane met with First Admiral Lord Mulgrave, who asked for the Scotsman's personal advice. The idea of using fire ships was put on the table, and mm. Cochrane insisted that the plan would only work if supplemented by ships laden with explosives and rockets to further eliminate the enemy's ability to resist amidst fire and He does seem to like those, huh? Chaos. Satisfied with this plan, Lord Mulgrave ordered Cochrane to join Admiral Gambia's fleet at Basque Roads and personally lead the fireship's charge. Wow. This dismayed the Scotsman, who personally despised Admiral Gambia, believing him <laughs> to be the exact breed of corrupt ah. aristocrat who had so often hampered his career. Yeah, and I mean, to be fair, um, you know, I talk about the, the lack of respect between sort of the high command and Cochrane. Uh, and though Cochrane was a, a well-born individual, I mean, he is right that a lot of militaries around the world at this point were characterized by a pretty high level of aristocratic corruption. Uh, it was pretty difficult to move up through the ranks if you didn't have those connections. Or, I mean, Cochrane is of noble birth, but even if you weren't high enough up that ladder... And so a lot of these institutions are very frustrating and would frustrate a lot of people, particularly, say, more middle class officers in the army or the navy. Those who were below the rank of even Cochrane, they had no noble birth. Uh, this was one of the reasons, in fact, why the French Revolution had occurred. Or one of the contributing factors was that there was a lot of middle class, low born uh, officers in the French army who were extremely talented but couldn't move up any further because all the top positions were taken by aristocrats who often really had, you know, not the talent to fill those positions. And so when the revolution happened, all of these low-born or middle-class officers, well, they sided with the revolutionaries who allowed them to sort of rise up. So this is a common issue of this era. 
Um, it was sort of changing at this point, late 17 into early 1800s, but there are you know, still remnants of that aristocratic system. Despite his insistence, Mulgrave would not rescind the order, and Cochrane begrudgingly sailed Imperius to join the British war fleet. Mm. Cochrane arrived at Basque Roads on April 3rd, and found his suspicions of Admiral Gambia had proven to hold warrant. Gambia was a vacillating commander, an evangelical Christian who insisted on distributing religious tracts to his men, making mm. them study them rather than actively planning an attack. Yeah, so that might have been more cool a couple hundred years earlier, <laughs> but if we're talking about, uh, you know, the British Navy in the early 1800s, we've definitely entered an era where we're more focused on science <laughs> uh, and military planning rather than religion, so this definitely would have seemed a little odd to everybody. The arrival and appointment of Lord Cochrane as head of the coming assault did not help matters. One Admiral Sir Eliab Harvey was enraged that he had been snubbed of the role in place of a junior officer, oh. and fiercely denounced Gambia, calling him a psalm slinger, as well as claiming, I never saw a man so unfit for the command of the fleet. If Admiral Nelson were here, he would not have anchored in Basque Roads at all, but would have dashed the enemy at once. Mm. Harvey had been the captain of the HMS Temeraire. He was a hero of the Battle of Trafalgar, yet he was sent to London and court-martialed all the same. Damn. His departure was an ill omen for the British fleet. Yeah, I mean, you know, I understand the line of command, enforcing discipline, but it's always kind of difficult when you have someone who's sort of seen as a hero, and then you have to punish them and take them out of the situation. It's just not really great for anybody. The two fleets stood nine miles apart from one another in an indefinite standoff. The French column, commanded by Admiral Zachary Almont, was comprised of 11 ships of the line and four frigates, organized into two rows, wedged between the tiny Ile Dex and the perilous shallow Boyard Shoal. Mm. Furthermore, a fortified garrison, complete with operational gun batteries, sat firmly on the island's northern edge. With both... Yeah, it's interesting, uh, we almost never hear about the French naval efforts during the Napoleonic Wars, um, think about what I mentioned earlier, how focused we are on Napoleon and the warfare on land. So I know, I would say virtually nothing about the French Navy of this era. I know a little bit about the British Navy because it's so famous, but not the French. Sides inaccessible to the British vessels, the French had secured their flanks and were firmly wedged in. Realizing there was no time to waste, Cochrane asked for permission to convert the transport ships in Gambia's fleet into fire ships and explosive vessels, which was mm. granted. Three explosion vessels were prepared, their holds packed with 1,500 barrels of gunpowder stuffed into casks and tied together, supplemented Whoa. by 3,000 hand grenades, all tied to a long fuse lit from the ship's stern. Okay. Giving this brave crew around 15 minutes to scuttle off in a lifeboat. I mean, we've seen Cochrane do this sort of thing on a smaller scale, um, but it, at least from what it appears to me, this is a much larger scale, so I'm curious to see how successful this is. Before the big detonation. Eight more prepared fire vessels arrived on April 10th, sent by Lord Melville. Having prepared his deadly squadron of suicidal vehicles, Cochrane asked Gambia for permission to begin the attack post-haste and charge straight for the French line. Mm. Gambia refused, denouncing the Scotsman's head-on tactics as Ooh. sheer foolhardiness. Now look, I, I do see where he's coming from. Of course, there's a line between swift, decisive action and just being foolish and rash. Unfortunately, that line is very blurry, and sometimes, whether an action is rash or decisive is really determined by the outcome. <laughs> if it goes well, then you're brave and decisive and daring. If it goes badly, then you're an idiot and you're going to be court-martialed, right? So I do see where Gambier's coming from. But I would also say, I know you don't really like Cochrane, a lot of you guys don't, but he has proven himself up to this point, so maybe take a chance on him. I don't know. It is certainly a risky method, 
but like I said, we have seen a lot of success from Cochrane before. This infuriated Cochrane, who countered that further delay would lead to the French Admiral doubtlessly catching on to the fireship plan and putting safeguards in place, inevitably leading to the loss of more British lives. Mm. Sure enough, the next morning's sun revealed the existence uh. of a massive boom that barricaded the narrow channel between the fortress at Dix and the Boyard Shoal. Furthermore, Admiral Almol had in fact been made aware of the British fireships, and had ordered the front row of his ships of the line to point forward to present a smaller target. Damn! Seventy canoes were deployed to wait by the boom, equipped with towing lines, so as to tug any approaching fireships out of harm's way. Yep, I mean, that is an appropriate response from the French, so that was a situation where... Like I said, Gambier should have taken the chance on Cochrane, let him do what he was going to do, because now the chance is sort of gone. While the French frigates too sailed ahead of the fleet to guard the harbour chain against British incursions. As day turned to dusk on April 11th, the winds began to churn, turning the coastal seas into a choppy tempest. Mm. It was at this time that Gambier finally approved the fireship's assault, perhaps taking advantage of the poor conditions to discourage Cochrane. Nevertheless... You think that's going to discourage Cochrane? I don't think anything would discourage Cochrane. If he has a plan that he wants to do, he is absolutely going to go through with it. The Sea Wolf was undeterred and yep. pressed forward with his plan. Of course. His crew was made up purely of volunteers, as fire ships fell outside the conventional boundaries of warfare and mm. sailors captured by the enemy while operating them would not be taken prisoner, oh, but damn. instead executed. Really? At around 8 p.m. That's sort of an interesting way of doing things. I would have thought that, you know, regardless of the action taken, if you're an official part of the army, <laughs> then you would officially be taken prisoner. But I guess that is not how it worked. M. Three explosive ships barreled down towards the French boom, taking advantage of the flood tide. One was captained by Frederick Mayat, one of Cochrane's most trustworthy officers, while the Sea Wolf captained one himself, taking the lead. Jeez. At around I mean, look, whatever you say about Cochrane, and I think there's a lot of good stuff to say, and some bad, we talked about that ego before, but whatever you say about him, this man is extraordinarily brave. <laughs> I mean, he is willing to risk his life seemingly every single assault. He's always at the front of his men, always on the front lines, really willing to commit his life to his plan. I mean, that's the belief he has in these plans that he lays out. And so far, he's been successful. So let's see what happens here. Around half past eight, Cochrane determined that his floating bomb was around 10 minutes away from the boom. He commanded his crew immediately proceed to the lifeboats to evacuate and personally lit the fuse creating a <laughs> countdown for his vessel's imminent explosion. Mm. Together they boarded the dinghy and rowed vigorously against the currents to get out of range <laughs> of the incoming blast. Yeah, they I imagine. They discover about a hundred yards out that they had left their mascot dog on board. <gasps> Refu you cannot leave the dog, come on now. Refusing to let his pooch get blown up, Cochrane rowed back to yes! the floating time bomb, climbed aboard, grabbed the dog, and jumped back into the dinghy. Okay, now we've got a movie, a movie or a comic book hero on our hands. He goes back to save the dog. That's what we like to see. <laughs> Once more rowing away with extra vigor. Soon, the floating bomb hit the boom, and a massive explosion illuminated the night sky. A veritable fireworks display of destruction. God, imagine what a sight that would be to see. I mean, you're all on your ships. There's probably not too much lighting around. Um, you know, the only lighting is going to be provided by fire, so lamps, candles, etc. Maybe you can see a little bit in the distance, but it's pitch dark. It's the middle of the night, and all of a sudden you see this massive explosion in the distance. I mean, that would be just an impressive sight. The explosive vessel was torn apart, and in turn shredded the massive chain that stood between the Royal Navy and its foe. Mm. Ten minutes later... Mayat's vessel collided with what remained, creating a second eruption, which scattered the French canoes that had been waiting to tow away the attackers. 
Nice. This annihilation completely dumbfounded Admiral Almor, for fireships were one thing, but in no world could he imagine his opponent creating explosive vessels. <laughs> a now, by the way, imagine how effective this attack would have been if Gambier had approved it immediately instead of waiting for the French to set up their defenses. I mean, still incredibly impressive, but it could have been even better if Cochrane was given free reign from the beginning. Monstrosity that disregarded every convention of civilized warfare. Hmm. The third explosion vessel had run aground and been put out of commission, but the way was now cleared and it was time for the inferno. At 9.30 p.m., 20 British fireships began their way down the channel. Oh man. The French frigate Vanguard quickly cut their anchor lines and fled hastily back towards the main fleet. Yet the fireships soon encountered trouble. The choppy currents made their navigation perilous, causing mm. many captains to panic, then light and abandon their ships too early, causing the burning husks to drift harmlessly into the shoals on. Yeah, look, when you got a plan like this, you know, planned by the daring, brave madman Cochrane. You need some equally daring, brave madmen to pilot these ships, because if they lose their nerve, then they're not going to go through with the plan. And in a plan like this, you need uh, a steel nerve <laughs> to actually stick on this ship, see it through, uh, until the point where you can let it go and set it alight. On either side of the channel. However, the Stormy Sea worked too in the British favour, rendering mm. the waters too perilous for their French foes to manoeuvre. Of 20 fire ships, four managed to make it into the French anchorage, and from there, chaos was the order of the night. Wow. A flaming vessel latched onto the 74-gun Regulus, causing the ship of the line to crash into its fellow French Tourville. Oh, great. Several more ships were set alight as rockets flared chaotically across wooden decks. <laughs> I mean, once again, what a visual. Um, of course, this is effective at causing destruction and chaos in the enemy fleet, but also imagine sort of the psychological impact. <laughs> it's nighttime, you really aren't expecting anything to happen, and all of a sudden the Brits blow up your defenses and then, like maniacs, suicidal maniacs, manage to set several of your ships on fire. It's chaos. I mean, that would be very psychologically impactful, I think. Men drowned, diving overboard to escape the flames, creating a scene of panic incarnate. Yeah. By daybreak, it was revealed that of 14 French ships, all but two had been damaged and run aground wow. on the nearby mudflats in an attempt to evade the fires, rendered completely immobile. Cochrane had since made it back to the Imperieuse, and knew that the time to strike was now, when mm. the enemy was trapped and helpless. Yet Admiral Gambier refused to give the order. Oh, bro, Cochrane come on. Was... I, like I said, I did empathize with his cautiousness earlier on, even though it was a mistake. But at this point, you know, we've sort of, we've seen proof, right? We've had successes. Now is the time to go. I mean, now is the time when, you know, Gambier is not just a cautious guy. But, you know, he's he's ruining the plan, basically, by being far too cautious. You need to at least be a little decisive if you want to be in a position of authority. Flawed with disbelief, unable to comprehend how a man with 11 battleships and 7 frigates at his disposal refused to engage an enemy who at current had only 2 operational vessels. Yeah. By noon, the Océan and four other French ships had been put back afloat and were retreating deep into the mouth of the River Charente. Knowing that total victory was slipping out between his fingers, Cochrane committed an act of blatant insubordination, <laughs> launching HMS Imperieuse deep into the gulf alone. <laughs> Once again, insane, crazy, extraordinarily daring and brave. But this tracks, <laughs> I mean, this is exactly what you would expect from Cochrane. Um, really, I mean, really, the main emotion is frustration with the Gambier. But if he's not going to do anything, then you can damn well expect that Cochrane will. To take on the entire French fleet single-handedly, saying later in his own words, it was better to risk the frigate or even my commission than suffer a disgraceful termination to the expectations of the Admiralty. Damn. Imperius engaged the beached vessel Calcutta, 
with the two warships exchanging deadly broadsides, with the British frigate at an immense advantage. Though what I will say about this plan, uh, plan, is that it's not really a plan. <laughs> I mean, we've seen daring plans from Cochrane before. This isn't really a plan. This is a spur-of-the-moment, spontaneous dive headfirst into the action. I'm not sure how advisable this is. Uh, this might be, you know, with Cochrane, there's always a spectrum between sort of brave and insane. This may be more towards the insane side of things, but once again, it all depends on the outcome. Simultaneously, Cochrane ordered his bow and stern cannons fired into the Aquilon and Ville de Varsovie, respectively. Beached they may have been, but a single frigate was still engaged in a duel with three ships of the line twice its size. Yeah, though I can see the rest of the British fleet appears to be following behind, finally. Soon, the Calcutta surrendered and was captured by Cochrane's crew. Wow. It was at this point that Gambia finally sent some backup into the channel unable to let one impetuous captain take on the entire French navy. Five frigates and two ships of the line entered Basque Roads. Calcutta was abandoned and set aflame, while the Aquila and Ville de Varsovie quickly surrendered. A fourth ship, Tonnerre, was scuttled by its own crew. Wow. The I mean, and let's be honest, almost all of this was done by Cochrane single-handedly. Of course, the men under him who went through with his plan uh, all respect to them as well, but in terms of leadership, this was basically all Cochrane. Battle of Basque Roads was undoubtedly a victory for the Royal Navy, who had sunk three French ships of the line, a fourth rate, and a frigate, all while losing only 30 men and no ships Damn. of their own. However, had Gambia shown any initiative, the entire French Atlantic fleet could have been destroyed yeah. in the space of the morning, yeah. whereas e now the- Easily. Really, they easily could have taken the entire French Atlantic fleet. And, I mean, in retrospect, they didn't need to. I mean, Britain would maintain its naval domination. But that would have been an incredible victory. And I'm sure it would have been very helpful to the war effort. The majority of it would live to fight another day. Cochrane remained infuriated by Admiral Gambia's incompetence and, upon returning to England, publicly shamed him for his conduct. Of course. Defiance in the face of authority was nothing new to Cochrane, but never before had he been so enraged or so viciously ripped into the personal character of such a powerful, well-connected man. Yeah, Cochrane's done this before. This is sort of a new level, and uh, I worry he's about to get himself into a lot of trouble, which is a shame because we've just seen his massive, impressive success. But as we've seen before, a lot of that can be negated if he behaves badly and publicly calls out his superiors, which he's doing right now, and I'm sort of sensing that something bad might be coming. Gambia demanded a court-martial to determine his innocence. Of course. Naturally, the tribunal was stacked with aristocrats sympathetic to him, and the admiral was exonerated from all wrongdoing, while Cochrane, known for his impudence, had suffered a dire blow to his reputation. <sighs> it's ridiculous. This incident compelled Cochrane... It's ridiculous. Now, I get it. It would probably be better if Cochrane could learn some people skills. <laughs> that might help him out. But still, it is it is frustrating to see a man like this so brilliant. I mean, he really is. Um, a naval genius, I think you could call him, be held back by these sort of annoying social limitations to refuse further naval appointments, and from 1809 onwards, the oh, Wolf wow. of the Sea focused on his career as a member of the British Parliament. Interesting. Indeed, Cochrane had pursued political ambitions. I mean, I think his talents are best used to sea, but I can imagine that he was probably feeling very frustrated at that point, so I, I totally sympathize. Since 1806, when he'd first been elected as a representative of the Riding of Honiton, and later Westminster, acting as hmm. MP concurrently with his naval service. He used his position to campaign for hard naval reforms, becoming an outspoken critic of the corruption in the Royal Navy. Good. The following years saw Cochrane's popularity increased with the common people. Okay, well hey, I said his talents are best used to sea, and that's probably true, but it looks like his talents are also well used in politics. As he continued to relentlessly campaign against the aristocrats. 
yet he had few friends in parliament mm. and near none amongst the lordship and admiralty. Yeah, this is the early 1800s. I mean, if you think politics is elitist today, <laughs> which it is, you know, it was far, far, far more elitist at this point. Cochrane having the support of the general public is great. I mean, that's amazing. It shows that he and his ideas were truly popular. But at this point, it's not going to get you too far in politics. Um, you know, most people at this point can't vote. Public action is still not too influential at this point. You know, the most important political decisions are made by these corrupt, aristocratic, or at least upper-class members of parliament. So it is great that he had the people on his side, but the voice of the people is not too influential. So I feel like he might struggle to get his reforms through unless he can build some political connections. In 1814, Cochrane was implicated in a great stock exchange fraud, accused of deliberately oh. misleading the public about Napoleon's death to increase the value of his government securities shares. That's not great. Naturally, the young lord protested his innocence, but his words fell deaf upon the courts, who had likely been bought out by his many shadowy enemies. Okay, so, but the question I have is, <laughs> did or did he not perpetuate a scam knowingly, or do we not know? I mean, the way they're framing it, it seems like the cards are stacked against him, and so he was seen as guilty immediately, uh, and I'm sure that was the case. But of course, the question would be, was he guilty? Or was this some sort of mix-up or accident? Or uh, do we not have the sources to say either way? I, I don't know, maybe some of you have that information. Acting vindictively upon him for his attempts to disrupt their status quo. As punishment for his alleged fraud, Cochrane was dishonorably expelled from Parliament wow. and formally discharged from the Royal Navy, an institution he had won countless victories for. His honours were revoked, and he was sentenced to 12 months in jail. Damn! It was there, in the dour walls of King's Bench Prison, that this chapter of the Sea Wolf's story came to an end. In 1815, Napoleon was finally defeated at Waterloo, and his demise brought an end to the war that had defined the entirety of Cochrane's naval career. Yeah, I mean, the war has basically defined his whole career, if you consider that his political career was defined by pushing reforms for the Navy. So, I mean, this war, the Napoleonic Wars, have been so important to Cochrane. They've been uh, his life, or at least part of his life, for many, many years now. I do wonder what he's going to do afterwards. Of course, not to mention that he's in jail right now. Uh, his reputation has been besmirched. Um, I mean, the elites didn't like him before, but now he's totally out of those circles. So I, I wonder what he's going to do after this. But the disgraced Scotsman was unable to bask in this glory, having been left to rot in prison. Yeah. Never one to accept his fate, Cochrane escaped from King's Bench <laughs> in March wow. of 1815. I mean, you know, proving time and time again that, you know, he's no regular officer, he's no regular politician. Uh, it's been, you know, years since we've seen sort of a daring exploit like this. Uh, ever since he left the Navy, but uh, he's here to remind us that Cochrane is still himself, and he's planning a daring escape from prison. What a guy. Scaling down the prison walls from a three-story window using a contraband rope. Instead of fleeing, he went to Westminster and demanded what? his seat in the House of Commons, where he had served before his unceremonious conviction in the Great Stock Exchange fraud. Unsurprisingly, he was promptly arrested and thrown back into jail. Yeah, l like I said, sometimes I do think he's a little too bold for his own good, but it, it really wouldn't be in his nature to scurry away and flee like a rat. You know, I, I, I guess it's far more in his character to present himself to Parliament. Um, though, I wonder, I'm sure he knew, or maybe he didn't, maybe his ego was so blown up that he thought maybe he could actually get away with it. Of course, there was no chance that he would have got away from this situation without being tossed back into prison. Cochrane was released in June upon finishing his sentence and rejoined his family. 
In the years since his resignation from the Royal Navy, he had married a woman named Kitty and they had a son, Thomas Jr. Mm. In 1818, Cochrane was approached by the representative of Chile in London, Don Jose Alvarez. At this time, Chile was a rebel nation fighting for its freedom against Spain. Mm. The aftermath of... Yeah, well, you know, in the late 17... into primarily the early 1800s, as the Napoleonic Wars were raging in Europe, Spain basically lost control of its colonial empire, and Latin America has been embroiled in independence revolutions for years at this point. Um, so there's, you know, a lot of chaos, a lot of action going on down there. ...of Napoleon's demise saw much of South America rise in open rebellion against the Spanish Empire, yeah. fighting in wars made iconic by the likes of Simon Bolivar, who at present... The Liberator. Uh, I really think that Simon Bolivar should be more well-known in the non-Spanish-speaking world. I imagine he's pretty famous in the Spanish-speaking world, but, you know, speaking as someone from the English-speaking world, I, I really feel like he's not well-known enough. I mean, this is a man who, like, liberated almost all of Latin America, not single-handedly, and it's complicated, but his importance really cannot be understated. ...was engaged in a struggle to establish republics in Colombia and Bolivia. Chile had enjoyed much success in this regard. Under the leadership of the General Jose de San Martin and mm. the Irish-descended Commander Bernardo O'Higgins, much of inland Chile... I always love those names when <laughs> you have... And you see this sometimes. I mean, just in general, but um, if you want to look at uh, European politics or European military, um, there was a bit of an Irish diaspora after British colonization. And so I don't know if that's why you know, Bernardo uh, is there, but there were a lot of characters like a Bernardo O'Higgins who have a Spanish or French uh, or Italian first name and then an extremely Irish last name. Uh, I just think the contrast is a little funny. Italy had been liberated. However, at sea, the Spanish were still strong. Held up in the highly fortified coastal fortresses from Peru to Patagonia, mm. they threatened the new republic with a counter-revolutionary strike. Ambassador Alvarez had specifically sought out Cochrane and implored him on behalf of the Commander-in-Chief of the Chilean Republic, O'Higgins, to assume command of the Chilean Navy and drive the Spanish ah. from their coasts. Interesting. So I knew that Cochrane got involved in these Latin American wars for independence. I did not know how or when that came about. But this is making a bit of sense. Basically, he's disgraced. <laughs> His career has been run into the ground. But at least some people seem to remember his naval brilliance. And they're willing to, you know, ignore uh, how besmirched his reputation is for him to lead their navy with, you know, his talents and his genius. So that, that's making a lot of sense. On August 15th, 1818, Cochrane departed for Chile with his family. On November 29th, Cochrane came upon the docks of Valparaiso, the provisional capital of the Republic. And I mean, Cochrane wasn't the only one to do this. I think he's probably one of the more high-profile examples. But following the end of the Napoleonic Wars, there were a lot of European, I think primarily British, um, you know, army officers, naval officers, whatever, who were kind of left with not much to do, and so they were either invited or went on their own accord to fight in the newest hotspot of global violence, which at that time was Latin America with the wars of independence. They could make a little bit of money. They could fight for uh, a good cause, whether they believed in it or not. That was sort of up for question. I, I think some of them did, some of them didn't. But, you know, it was a way to go and use their skills they developed during the Napoleonic Wars uh, and benefit from it. Soon he was introduced to the Chilean Navy. It was not much, consisting merely of three frigates, three brigs, oh. and a sloop. Yeah. The largest ship... It's a bit of a downgrade from the British Navy. <laughs> ...was a 50-gunner, O'Higgins, named after Chile's commander-in-chief. Cochrane made this vessel into his flagship. On January 16th, 1819, Cochrane set sail upon his first South American campaign. 
Mm. To his great irritation, he found out that his five-year-old son had enthusiastically stowed himself aboard his flagship. <laughs> I mean, look, he's clearly learning from his father. <laughs> you know, daring, brave, kind of stupid. Uh, that sounds exactly like the kind of thing Cochran would have done. By the time the child had been discovered, it was too late to turn back. He begrudgingly allowed his son to stay aboard, where the sailors <laughs> outfitted the boy as a midshipman. <laughs> One of the Spanish fortresses in the region was the harbour town of Callao, where Spanish ships could resupply their soldiers under the protection of a massive beachfront fortress. Mm. Cochran made Callao his target, for he had received intel that the two most powerful Whoops. frigates in the Spanish fleet, Esmeralda and Venganza, were anchored there. In February, they arrived at the town, which conveniently was celebrating a carnival. Mm. Cochrane's plan was to cut into the harbour with two of his warships while the town was distracted by the festivities, board the two Spanish frigates, and make off with them as a prize. Alright Cochrane, it has been a couple of years since you've been in some real naval action. Let's see if you've still got it. Yet, as the O'Higgins and Lautaro made forth, a thick fog blanketed mm. the rocky anchorage, making it far too dangerous to approach and costing them valuable time. Mm. The fog soon lifted, revealing the Chilean advance to the 350 guns stationed on the nearby fortress. Oh. Fully manned and ready to unleash hell, it turned out that Callao had not been as taken by merriment as they had hoped. Ooh. Lautaro quickly listed off to safety, leaving Cochrane aboard the O'Higgins to bear the brunt of the oncoming cannonade. The Scotsman immediately made maneuvers to veer out of range, but to his horror, he saw his toddler son run on uh -oh. deck, enthusiastic to join in the action. Oh, no. A Spanish cannonball whizzed over the deck, blowing off the head of a nearby marine and splattering Tiny Tom in blood. Oh. Cochrane stood paralyzed in terror until the child shouted, I am not hurt, Papa. The ball did not touch me. Jesus, okay, the idea of a son stowing on board was funny initially, but we are in an active war zone. It's getting a little worrying. Um, you know, perhaps not one of Cochrane's finest moments. It does seem like there were some circumstances which he had no control over, like uh, the weather, but uh, this is not going great so far. Cochrane quickly tacked his vessel out of cannon range, all the while ordering his son to be carried back below. Not wanting to miss the action, Tom struggled and screamed until he was allowed to stay. Jesus. Yo Higgins managed to escape with little damage. Kids. But once again, um, he's clearly learning from his father. <laughs> he absolutely should not be above deck. It's far too dangerous. But you know that a young Thomas Cochrane would also refuse to be dragged below deck. So, you know, like father, like son. Unfazed, Cochrane engaged in an exchange of prisoners with the fortress, trading captives he had taken from a royalist gunboat for indentured Chileans. Okay. During these talks, the Spanish Viceroy demanded to know why a British officer would serve a nation of continental rebels. Cochrane replied, A British nobleman is a free man, capable of judging between right and wrong, and at liberty to adopt a country and a cause which aim at restoring the rights of oppressed human nature. I appreciate that, fighting for principle over country. And in addition, um, I mean, it's not like Britain was super fond of rebellions like this, but at the same time, Britain wasn't like super close with Spain, so I don't think they had too much of an interest in maintaining Spanish domination over, um, you know, these nations trying to fight for independence, and a lot of Brits definitely had principles of liberty and independence. So yeah, I think this makes sense. The Spaniards remembered all too well the terror that Cochrane had caused them aboard HMS Speedy 20 years earlier. Yup. I mean, look, Cochrane's reputation seems to have been kind of ruined back home in Britain. Seems he's been forgotten a little bit, but uh, I imagine his enemies remember him, <laughs> remember how much of a threat he was back in the day. Cochrane was pleased to hear that Spanish sailors had a nickname for him, El Diablo. <laughs> Having exhausted the devil, man, even better than the sea wolf. Well, the sea wolf sounds a little cooler, but this one's definitely more threatening than the sea wolf. All his avenues into Callao, Cochrane turns to the south and set his sights upon Valdivia. While O'Higgins respected Cochrane, he refused to lend him funds and manpower for an assault on that city, 
mm. as it was widely considered to be the most impregnable redoubt in all South America. I mean, I also imagine that O'Higgins, considering the situation, probably didn't have access to that much manpower or guns, right? I mean, they're fighting uh, a revolution. They're fighting for independence against this massive, though very much weakened Spanish empire. I feel like he probably didn't have too much to give. So he has to, in his position, he does have to be cautious. Chile would never be secure while Valdivia remained Spanish, but attacking it was considered suicide. But Cochrane never cared about the odds. <laughs> yep. So in December of 18... All right, he's going for it anyway. 1819, the Sea Wolf sailed southwards with only his flagship, fully intending to take on Latin America's most fortified stronghold alone. That sounds like on him. On January 17th of 1820, the O'Higgins arrived at Coral Bay, an estuary upon which seven heavily garrisoned fortresses stood firm. These land batteries formed the main obstacle between Cochrane and the city of Valdivia proper, which lay 16 miles upriver. Success was paramount, both to maintain the Sea Wolf's near mythic reputation and to stay in good graces with the Chilean government. Yep. Once again, Cochrane is left with one ship under his command. And look, he's extremely talented in these sorts of situations, but it's kind of a shame that he was never allowed to rise higher in the British Navy, because it's clear he was also a talented commander of an entire fleet. You know, there are some guys out there who, they're good at captaining one ship, but you give them uh, control of an entire fleet, and they sort of fall apart, they can't handle it. I don't think Cochrane was like that. Um, he clearly had the ability to command many, many ships, but he keeps getting put in these situations where he has just one, or only a few. Luckily, the campaign got off to a good start. Cochrane had employed his classic false flag technique, mm. flying Spanish colours in the bay. When the royalist brig Patrillo listed towards the shore, she was promptly deceived and captured. Hmm. Aboard Potrillo was $20,000 and a highly detailed sea chart of the harbour of Valdivia. Hey. Having performed a satisfactory reconnaissance, the O'Higgins sailed up the coast and travelled to Talcarano Bay, where the local Chilean governor levied 250 men for the Sea Wolf's cause. Okay, Th that makes sense. Cochrane shows a little bit of success. He gets a little bit of support. Cochrane also managed to recruit the services of two schooners, the Montezuma and Intrepido. Together, they sailed southwards once more, knowing that 350 sailors in three wooden ships were about to face down 2,000 <laughs> soldiers stationed across seven fortresses of stone. Yeah. After being briefly run aground by a rogue wind on the island of Kiriquina, the O'Higgins managed to get back afloat through some vigorous bilge pumping and Cochrane's personal carpentry skills. Wow. However, the ship remained damaged, and the water that flooded the hull had ruined the powder magazine and most of the ammunition aboard. Mm. Undeterred, Cochrane simply convinced his crew they would find victory through use of their bayonets alone. Can someone tell me, by the way, Fort Inglés, does that not mean Fort English? Uh, if I'm correct, that's the pronunciation. Maybe I'm off, but you can tell me if that's right. The frigate rendezvoused back with the two schooners. The crew of the leaking O'Higgins was transferred to the Montezuma and Intrepido, both of whom docked just off Fort Ingles at the mouth of the river Valdivia, flying Spanish colours so not to alert the defenders <laughs> inside. Always tricky, and once again, always on the front lines, using his personal carpentry skills to get the boat afloat. You know, and, and I mean, in this situation, it sort of has to be that way, because once again, he's in control of only three ships, but I don't think Cochrane would really have it any other way. He does always want to be at the forefront. Cochrane had realized that most of the enemy fortresses were designed to repel a seaward assault, and a land attack might have the element of surprise. Okay. As he explains to his crew... Operations unexpected by the enemy are, when well executed, almost certain to succeed, whatever may be the odds. I am, one, his career has proven that true, and two, I do think that is generally true. Now, whatever the odds, maybe not, <laughs> I do think there's some odds you can't overcome, but the element of surprise, really there is almost nothing more important in a military situation. 
if you add the element of surprise, you already have a massive, massive advantage. So I, I do think he's basically correct with that. On the afternoon of February 3rd, the Spaniards demanded the two vessels identify themselves. Cochrane sent an officer ashore to parley with the Spaniards in Fort Ingles, claiming they had been blown off course from a Spanish squadron <laughs> rounding Cape Horn. The Spaniards didn't buy this story, and at Ooh. precisely 4pm opened fire on Intrepido, breaching its hull and killing two soldiers. Damn. Cochrane was forced to order the immediate commencement of his assault. To that aim, a vanguard was formed. 44 marines, led by English-born Major William Miller, were boarded. What I mentioned earlier, you know, there's a lot of these foreign, I guess you could call them mercenaries. Um, <laughs> you know, that might be a coarse word for it, but that's basically what they are. A lot of these foreign mercenaries who fought in the Napoleonic Wars. I don't know if this guy did in particular, but here's an example of an English-born fellow who is now involved in the Latin American Wars for Independence. And there's quite a few of them. ...boarded upon a canoe and began a perilous approach upon the beach of Fort Ingles. The Spaniards sent out an advanced contingent of 75 soldiers, launching volley after volley of musket fire upon the Chilean boat. Mm. A handful of marines were killed, but the rowers pressed on bravely under fire. Damn, Eventually really? Eventually reaching the shore, Major Miller led a fierce bayonet charge upon the enemy. Wow. I mean, it's incredibly difficult to just hold your ground on land against enemy fire. Imagine rowing up onto shore and then doing a bayonet charge. I mean, that takes intense, intense bravery in order to do that and not lose your nerve and row the other direction. Routing the Spanish force back into their fort, a tentative beachhead had been established. Mm. Soon, night had fallen, and the second phase of Cochrane's plan fell into motion. Under the cover of darkness, 250 Chilean soldiers were quickly ferried onto the beach. Guided by a captured Spaniard, they climbed the rocky bluffs onto the grassy heights upon which the fort stood. From there, the assault team split into two commands. The first approached the seaward wall of Fort Ingles, making as much noise as possible, whooping, hollering, mm. and firing their muskets into the air while remaining out of gunfire range. They had precious little ammunition, but Cochrane knew that this bluff was crucial to his success. All right, I'm curious to see how Cochrane manages to do this. He's got a relatively small number of men versus an armed fort. For the second contingent had begun circling around to the fortress's inland face. They stalked silently through the darkness, whatever sound they made drowned out by the cacophony of their comrades in front of the fort. They concealed themselves within a grove of trees, trained their sights upon the distracted Spanish soldiers on the seaward wall, and unleashed a devastating musket volley with the nice. last of their remaining dry powder. In the ensuing chaos, the Chilean soldiers raised their bayonets and charged their enemy, screaming horrible war cries to appear all the more monstrous. Yeah, I mean, this must have been a pretty brutal and frightening sight to witness. Imagine if you're one of the Spanish soldiers in this fort, it's the middle of the night, you already know something's happening. But you get approached by these, you know, crazy, daring Chilean soldiers who are almost out of ammo. And so they're relying primarily on melee combat. Um, that would have been a very brutal and bloody scene. The Spaniards, gripped by darkness, confusion, and death, mm. succumbed to terror and evacuated Fort Ingles. But once again, by the way, we see Cochrane using his plans, his strategies... Uh, not only for military success in a more practical sense, but in order to inflict uh, terror, or I guess you could call it psychological damage on his enemies. I mean, that's basically what he's doing. He's trying to scare them, um, you know, like we've seen him do before. Like I was talking with the fire ships, part of that is the absolute spectacle. You're going to frighten your opponents, make them far more likely to panic and or retreat fleeing towards the neighboring Fort Carlos. They were pursued relentlessly by Cochrane's men, who impaled the panicked royalists as they ran. Ooh. As the Spanish garrison of Ingles fled towards the neighboring Fort San Carlos, the commander of the battery frantically ordered its gates open to receive the refugees. Uh -oh. 
in the shroud of night and amidst the chaos of terrorized men, the Sea Wolf's warriors slipped right in. See, I mean, that was the humane thing to do, <laughs> to let in the fleeing troops from the other fort. But, you know, in retrospect, it was also a mistake because now you've let in the Chilean troops. As brutal as it sounds, it actually would have been the better move to keep the gates closed. You do doom a bunch of your own soldiers to death, which is horrible, but maybe you can save your own fort. Through the open doors and began hacking away at the Spaniards inside. Once more, the combined garrisons of Ingles and San Carlos abandoned the second battery and fled towards Fort Amagos. The contest continued as an almost oh, comical again. game of dominoes as Fort Amagos suffered the very same fate that San Carlos had before it. Chilean soldiers... Yeah, I mean, Cochrane didn't even completely have the element of surprise, but, you know, he had, to some extent, the element of surprise, and you can see how effective it is here. I mean, like we said, this is a pretty small force of Chilean troops, and they are now sweeping through several Spanish fortresses. Just slipped through the open gates meant to bring sanctuary to their fleeing victims, and began ruthlessly hacking away at the souls within. Despite outnumbering the Chileans six to one, the Spaniards had been wholly routed by a wow. foe who in their eyes could be no less than the devil itself. <laughs> by the time for- Yeah, I'm sure this only enhanced his reputation. This plan had uh, a large chance of failing, like all of his plans, to be honest, but the fact that it did succeed, <laughs> That only makes Cochrane seem more threatening and intimidating. When Amagos had been subdued, Cochrane's men had killed a hundred Spaniards and wow. taken captive a hundred more. They moved on to Fort Chirocomayo, which was situated inland on a hill. Unlike the three forts before it, Chirocomayo offered token resistance, but was eventually overcome by the ferocity of the Sea Wolf's Marines. Yep. When the sun rose on the morning of February the 4th, Four out of the seven fortresses were in Chilean hands. Wow. Absolutely stunned by this humiliating defeat, Spanish morale was at an all-time low. Yup, that psychological effect. Uh, and once again, clearly, if you want to serve under Thomas Cochrane, you really have to be as brave and daring as he is. And we're seeing that here. Those Chilean troops, incredibly brave. I mean, willing to put it all on the line in order to take those forts. The fortresses on the eastern half of the harbour put up an unconvincing fight, opening fire upon the Montezuma and Intrepido as they sailed into the bay. Mm. However, when the O'Higgins reared its imposing hull within sight <laughs> of Fort Niebla, the last of the Spanish resolve broke. Too late. Believed... Yeah, it's just too late. To put up resistance now, not gonna happen. Crin would shell them with the captured artillery mm. from Fort Chirocomayo. This compounded with the firepower and inevitable reinforcements aboard the 50-gun frigate, made further resistance futile. Mm. In reality, this was yet another bluff, for the O'Higgins had no reinforcements aboard, <laughs> nor was it in any state to fight. Damn. Nevertheless, the Spaniards abandoned the eastern forts, and all of Coral Bay was now in Cochrane's hands. In total, he had lost only 26 men. Cochrane now advanced down the river to launch his assault upon the city itself. Yeah, I mean, we've still got the city itself to take, though I imagine part of the reason it was seen as, you know, defensible was because of all of those forts at Coral Bay, and they've now been taken over. <laughs> so the city might have a much smaller chance of resisting now. But, uh, I mean, I don't know, they've still got a garrison station there, some guns... So Cochrane's still got a bit to go before he actually conquers the city itself. Only to find that the Spanish governor had looted everything of value in his township ah. and fled with- Never mind. Uh, the, once again, that psychological effect, Cochrane's attack was so quick, intimidating, uh, and terror-inducing that the Spanish just decided to flee instead when- I think maybe they could have put up more resistance uh, at this point. Maybe not. Um, I mean, clearly they could have put up more resistance at every step along the process, but they didn't. With his garrison, the city of Valdivia was now officially in Chilean hands. Despite the sacking, there was plenty of booty to be had. 
bountiful amounts of arms, munitions, and currency were seized from the fortresses, nice. amounting to loot of the most promising proportions. More importantly, the last Spanish stronghold in Chile had been eliminated. Elim wow, you know, basically entirely due to the actions of Cochrane as his men, O'Higgins couldn't afford or didn't want to support him in this mission. So once again, we see this incredibly impressive achievement. And who's responsible? Cochrane. Just Cochrane. <laughs> he, he can do a lot with almost or no support is what I'm saying. Eliminating the final holdout of colonial power in the south of the continent. This victory effectively secured the long-term future of Chilean independence wow. and won them their autonomy over their coast and southern frontier. Wow, I see why he's such a well-regarded figure in Chilean history. It was the greatest victory that Lord Thomas Cochrane would win on South American soil. Cochrane then returned to Valparaiso. The Chilean government had assumed he would fail in his Valdivian campaign <laughs> and had preemptively prepared to court-martial him for insubordination. Man. Learning that he had six No faith, huh? Uh, always Cochrane with the court-martial. Seeded, they quickly backpedaled and publicly honored the Scotsman's victory. And we're gonna end it there. Um, you know, we have to end at some point, of course. Uh, this is the end of part two. We see Cochrane get his most impressive victory uh, in terms of... Latin American independence. He's arrived back. They were going to court-martial him. He's always in line for a court-martial, but fortunately, he was successful. Um, so hopefully, he'll get some of that respect back. Uh, like I said, his reputation was basically ruined back in Britain, but, uh, you know, hopefully he can get some of that love and adoration uh, from Chile. That'd be nice. Uh, show him some respect for the accomplishments he's achieved. Anyway, I very much enjoyed this one. This series has been fantastic so far. Um, stay tuned for part three. That'll be the last part of this series. Once again, if you guys enjoyed this video, I very much appreciate it if you would check out the Patreon or channel memberships and leave a like, subscribe, leave a comment, all that good stuff. I hope you guys are all having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.